By necessity, as we have long said, uh, there always has been a need for representatives of the Assad regime to be a part of that process. Um, it would not be um, and, uh, and would never be, and it wasn't what Secretary Kerry was intending to imply, that that would be Assad himself. With Miranda Khan, J.D. Hayworth back with you on America's Forum. That was State Department spokeswoman Jin Saki trying to clarify comments about her boss, John Kerry, what he had to say about possibly including uh, Syrian President Assad in any future peace negotiations. Yeah, Saki saying Assad himself, as we just heard, would never be at the negotiating table. Mm, sounds like a topic for discussion. Staying with us, former Congressman Michael Patrick Flanagan from Newsmax Washington and via phone likewise from Washington, General Michael Hayden, the former director of the National Security Agency and also the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, General Hayden, I'm going to ask you about what Secretary, State, uh, Secretary of State Kerry had to say to begin with. Okay. Do you think do you think when all the double talk is over it's really the American intent to negotiate directly with Assad? No, I, I don't think so and I I think this is an example of the secretary letting his enthusiasm and his language get ahead of him. Uh he actually does that a fair amount uh, in the in the energy of the moment. JD, the, the big point here is that the permanent government, not the political government, the permanent government saw what happened when we swept away the entire government of Libya after we overthrew Gaddafi. And that led to absolute chaos. And so I think what the secretary wanted to say and what Jen Psaki was trying to gently suggest was that we will talk with representatives of the current regime. But I don't think we'll talk to Assad. Michael Flanagan, we want to get your thoughts. Did Jen Psaki, is she just having to clean up her boss's mess? Well, I, I think there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time cleaning up the esteemed former junior senator from Massachusetts. It's mess. Uh, I, I think he's a, uh, he's a, uh, I think he's in, yeah, I think he's in over his head quite often. And I think that's too bad. But I do think he's well-intentioned. I think he is exuberant, and I think he does want to do the right thing. I'll say that for him. Does he want but to sit down with really Assad, though? I think it's really too bad that he's influential in this. I'm sorry? I, do, does he want to sit down with Assad, though? Or do you I, think he just misspoke? The, the president said without precondition he'd sit down with the leaders of Iran. He hasn't done that yet, but I mean, he, he may be echoing some of that same sentiment. That some desire that the cult of personality can overcome, you know, any sort of uh, difficulties that they may have together. Uh, General, I, I spent some time in Iraq on the reconstruction. If uh, Assad goes or if, if some sort of peace is discovered there, do you think there'll be a reconstruction led by us, and, and what might it look like? Are we talking about in, in, in Iraq, Michael? In Syria. In Syria. Um, frankly, let me be very dark, all right? I think the Syrian state is gone. Uh, the, you know, the, the entity we formerly called Syria isn't coming back in any way like its previous shape or form. It was a, an artificial state. European diplomacy created it for the convenience of Europeans. They've never reconciled the, the ethnic, religious, cultural, historical, economic cleavages inside inside the Syrian state. And, and so there may be peace in the region. We, 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 we may establish a new equilibrium, but I don't think it's the old equilibrium of that area being governed by a powerful central government in Damascus. And General Hayden, as you mentioned, what you believe to be a profound geopolitical uh, change, let's talk about some other things happening geopolitically, specifically the fact that ISIS apparently has made its way into Afghanistan, the UN, and now Russia apparently worried about this. Uh, is that, can that be considered a good thing if Russia is awakening to what, uh, what ISIS might be able to do? It, it, it can't hurt. It's not a bad thing. That, that said, when, when it really comes to conducting global counterterrorism efforts, KD, the Russians, the quote my Texan friends, are a lot more half in cattle. They're, they're brutal in their own space, uh, but globally, uh, they weren't a particularly useful partner for us when I was at CIA. Now, part of that could be my fault. Maybe I should have cultivated them more. That I, I'm didn't have an awful lot of stuff 
going back and forth between Langley and, and FSD headquarters in Moscow. Well, speaking of Moscow, uh, the strong man there, Vladimir Putin, back in public yesterday yeah. for the first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. We're going to step aside for a short time, and when we come back, more with Michael Hayden and Michael Patrick Flanagan as America's Forum rolls on on this St. Patty's Day. Top of the morning to you. Do you hear all the camera shutters click? This was not your typical photo opportunity yesterday at the Kremlin as Russian President Vladimir Putin finally reappeared publicly after a 10-day absence. Yeah, his disappearance fueled intense speculation over his health and whereabouts all sorts of rumors were flying. Rumors, informed speculation. I wonder what the hard intelligence tells us. Yeah. Uh, with Miranda Khan, J.D. Hayworth back here with you on the Anchor Desk. And from Washington, let's continue our conversation with Michael Patrick Flanagan, my former congressional colleague at Newsmax Washington, and via telephone with General Michael Hayden, the former director of the CIA and the NSA. General, I don't know if you were getting, I was getting all sorts of emails over the weekend uh, claiming some very curious things going on in Russia. What did you hear and how does it square with Putin's public appearance yesterday? Yeah, J.D., you and I must be in the same email circles because I was getting the same kind of emails about potential coup and, and all sorts of troop movements and so on. It all appears to have been smoke and mirrors. Vladimir is back, and he is in control. And this is a, an absence that may remain unexplained, but I don't think it changes much in terms of Russian policy or, frankly, what they're doing in eastern Ukraine. In general, in, in the Ukraine, a, a very sad and, and ugly episode that this country has largely ignored. Um, General Nicholson with NATO over there and others doing, uh, doing what they can. What, what more could or should we be doing uh, with the, frankly, Russian invasion of Ukraine? Yeah, I, I, I share your thoughts and your disappointment, Michael. Um, number one, we were late to the party. We kind of outsourced this whole relationship to the European Union, and I think they misstepped not anticipating Russian responses. Then, when all of this broke after the Sochi Olympics and Putin grabbed the Crimea, our response was, was largely rhetorical. Now, we have imposed sanctions. Sanctions hurt. If they're a lot like rust, they're inevitable, they're destructive, but they take a long time. And so I'm very fearful of what Putin does in the near term before these sanctions might cause elements around him to force him to change policy. And, and Michael... I'm all for giving defensive arms to the Ukrainians. Quite strikingly, Jim Clapper, the DNI, said that in open session. I made it clear with his personal view, not even necessarily the view of the intelligence community, that he thought we should be giving these people arms and upping the cost to the Russians for this activity. And I, I strongly agree. General, other countries are also fearful of a Russian invasion, included in that Poland. Does Poland have a right to be concerned? What about Lithuania? Well, I, I, they have a right to be concerned. I wouldn't call these unfounded fears. I think that, that the reality of any practical threat against them is, is way down near zero. But, you know, it, it doesn't require the actual invasion to have a negative impact on Poland or on the Baltic Republic. Um, the atmosphere in Europe has changed. Uh, the atmosphere now is a threatening Russia, an unpredictable Russia. And whether or not a, a Russian army soldier crosses the frontier into Lithuania, it still affects Lithuanian policy if the West shows weakness in the face of these Russian threats. And, and frankly, so far, I think we're more than a brick shy of a load in, in showing resolve, pushing back against the Russians. Let me double back to a question I asked earlier, this time directed to Michael Patrick Flanagan. Uh, Mike, in the 30 seconds that remain, what's going on in, uh, from your vantage point with ISIS in Afghanistan, and what do the Afghanis or the Russians or anybody really have to worry about there? I think the, the, the general probably could write a book on this subject, and I, I, he'd have a great answer to this question, but my answer is that 
the continued mm -hmm. disguising of all of these factions of Al Qaeda as if they were separate and different is really mystifying. They are all part of the same conglomerate. They all work with the with the funding by the D Company and the leaders in in Al Qaeda and the Haqqani Network and others. And they are global. And if they show up here and there under a different name, that should not be a distraction. And uh, we will be back right after this.